Hello and welcome to the second part of the lecture series on psychosis. This is Dr. Nicholas Hatcher and in this presentation we will examine psychosis from a genetic and neurobiological perspective. In this section on the predisposing factors for psychosis, I will have separate lectures exploring the psychological and philosophical implications. In the neurobiology of psychosis, there are alterations that we can identify lying on a spectrum from superficial to deep, macroscopic to microscopic. We will weave through these levels in the most suitable way in order to gain clarity of the underlying neurobiological predisposition. On the more superficial end of the spectrum, psychosis is a condition of frontotemporeal changes. The frontal lobe is primarily responsible for executive functions including action, problem solving, judgment, decision making, planning, and attention. The temporal lobe is primarily responsible for processing sensory information and forming memories as it houses the hippocampus. The parietal lobe is primarily responsible for integrating sensory information such as touch, temperature, pressure, pain, etc. The following images demonstrate some of the findings that point to a disturbance in the frontotemporeal system. Here I have a CT scan comparing a brain of a patient with schizophrenia on the right with a control brain on the left. There is marked cortical atrophy in the temporal, parietal, and especially prefrontal cortical region. There is also ventricular enlargement, particularly in the lateral and third ventricles. There is also ventricular enlargement, which can be seen in both the lateral and third ventricles. In preparation to show you a few positon emission tomography images, I'm providing this image to show what the different colors mean. Red and yellow indicate high activity, whereas blue, purple, and black indicate low to no activity. Remaining on the more superficial end of the scale, in this image, a patient with schizophrenia is on the right, whereas the unaffected control is on the left. You can see a significant decrease in glucose metabolism, which corresponds with activity in the patient with schizophrenia. Note that this reduction in activity is again reflective of a frontal, temporal, and parietal disturbance. Here is another set of scans showing how brain activity differs from a control group on the top and a group of individuals with schizophrenia on the bottom in various states. Moving a little deeper or departing from the most macroscopic level, we see patterns of disconnectivity. In this perspective, there are alterations in the way one region of the brain connects to another. It is in this domain that we begin to understand some of the symptoms of psychosis. A closer look at some of the key pathways altered within the frontotemporeal system reveals disconnectivity between the salience network, central executive network, default mode network, and hippocampus. Salience refers to the interestingness of stimuli. In thinking about this function, one can see the implications for abnormalities in this area with regards to hallucinations and delusions. While there is still ongoing investigation as to the mechanism of this network, the salience network has been implicated in the detection and integration of emotional and sensory stimuli. The salience network includes the anterior insula, abbreviated AI, which supports representations and updating of current and predictive salience, especially in the context of interoception. The salience network also includes the anterior cingulate cortex, abbreviated ACC, which is implicated in emotion formation and processing, learning, and memory. It is implicated in memory through its connection to the interrhinal cortex by way of the cingulum. The anterior cingulate cortex receives information from the thalamus and ultimately the neocortex. Overall, this system is involved in the detection and processing of emotionally salient events. The central executive network, abbreviated CEN, 
includes the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or DLPFC, and the posterior parietal cortex, or PPC. Overall, this network is associated with goal-directed and externally oriented tasks. The default mode network, or DMN, includes the medial prefrontal cortex, or MPFC, posterior cingulate cortex, or PCC, and the angular gyrus. This network is associated with self-related and internally oriented processes. As an example, the default mode network is highly active during daydreaming or mind wandering. The salience network is hypothesized to mediate switching between the default mode network and the central executive network. Therefore, impairment in the salience network can contribute to problematic switching between internally directed and externally directed cognition. The hippocampus is responsible for declarative, or in other terms, explicit memory, which is the memory of facts and events that can be consciously recalled or declared. There are some recent findings suggesting that not only are subregions of the hippocampus altered in enduring psychotic illness, but also findings suggesting the possibility of a biomarker and treatment implications for early onset or prodromal psychosis. I feel this discussion warrants more time and perhaps a devoted lecture. For now, know that these alterations within the hippocampus may contribute to abnormalities in how memories are stored, what content is stored, and how they are activated. This has implications not only for delusions, but also the generation of false memories, which may then provide the basis for logical inference, contributing to some of the cognitive changes we see in enduring psychotic illness. Some key implications of disconnectivity in the treatment of psychosis lies in the understanding of distinct dopamine pathways. As we will see in the lecture on the presentation of psychosis, dopamine pathways are implicated in the primary symptom domains, positive, negative, and cognitive. As we will see in the lecture on palliation of psychosis, some of the side effects of antipsychotic medications are related to altered dopaminergic activity in these pathways as well. For now, the four principal dopamine pathways are as follows. The mesolimbic pathway, branching from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens. The mesocortical pathway, branching from the ventral tegmental area to the orbitofrontal and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, as well as the anterior cingulate cortex. The nigrostriatal pathway, branching from the substantia nigra to the dorsal striatum, which is made up of the caudate and putamen. And the tubero-infundibular pathway, which extends from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. The ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra are the primary areas of the brain responsible for the production and storage of dopamine. On the most deep or microscopic level, there are changes in certain neurochemicals and receptors that have been implicated in psychosis. In addition to dopamine, the most well-known neurochemical associated with psychosis, there are also alterations in the concentration of N-methyl-D aspartate, or NMDA, gamma-aminobutyric acid, or GABA, glutamate, and serotonin, often abbreviated 5-HT. N-methyl-D aspartate, or NMDA, is an excitatory neurochemical that stimulates activity. Hypofunction of NMDA receptors results in a lack of release of gamma-aminobutyric acid, or GABA, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. GABAergic interneurons synapse onto glutamatergic neurons. Here, hyperactivity of serotonin 2A or 5-HT2A receptors results in excessive glutamate release which stimulates the ventral tegmental area, triggering the release of dopamine. Hyperactivity of dopamine 2 or D2 receptors along the mesolimbic pathway stimulate the ventral striatum, which includes the nucleus accumbens, resulting in hallucinations and delusions. The pathway on the far left 
is reflective of a pathway important in the understanding of the side effects of antipsychotics used to treat psychosis. In that, blocking D2 receptors along the nigrostriatal pathway will result in extrapyramidal symptoms, or EPS, which are movement abnormalities that will be discussed in the palliation lecture. Next, let's look at what contributes to these alterations, making the individual predisposed or vulnerable to psychosis. As alluded to in the prior lecture, heritability does not account for the full picture of enduring psychotic illness. At best, enduring psychotic illness is estimated to be 80% heritable. Siblings or offspring of an identified patient have a 10 times increased risk of developing schizophrenia. The rate of schizophrenia among monozygotic or identical twins is five times, or 40 to 50 percent, that of dizygotic or fraternal twins, which is 5 percent, and approximately 50 times that of the general population. A two-hit model is proposed in schizophrenia, in which insults early in brain development, prenatally or perinatally, combined with later disturbances in neuronal development in adolescence leading to psychosis. Several perinatal factors have been implicated in the development of enduring psychotic illness. Some of these factors include obstetric complications such as hemorrhage, preterm labor, RH incompatibility, and fetal hypoxia. Maternal factors such as starvation, a pro-inflammatory state, as is the case with autoimmune disease, stress, and infection have also been implicated. An increase in the incidence of schizophrenia is associated with prenatal exposure to a variety of maternal infections. There is a 20-fold increase with rubella, a 7-fold increase with influenza, and a 2.5-fold increase with toxoplasma gondii. It is estimated that 25% of people carrying the 22Q11.2 deletion develop schizophrenia, an increased odds ratio of 70 to 1, and 20 to 25 times the lifetime general population risk, which is around 1%. Individuals with this form of schizophrenia typically have distinguishable physical features, have a lower IQ, possible differences in auxiliary clinical features, and often childhood onset of schizophrenia. Genetic testing for 22Q11.2 is available. Another interesting finding is the elevation in C4 in patients with schizophrenia. In 2016, Sakar and colleagues analyzed 65,000 genomes to find a genetic abnormality linked to schizophrenia. Coincidentally, of the genomes explored, there is an abnormal region on chromosome 6 that codes for C4 that was found to be consistent among patients with schizophrenia. Variations of the alleles coding for C4 have been stratified based on relative risk of schizophrenia. The high-risk allele results in an upregulation of C4 synthesis. C4 in the central nervous system normally assists with synaptic pruning, a normal neuromaturation process by which extra synapses are eliminated. This pruning, driven by C4, is typically active between childhood and early adulthood. C4 is deposited in the synapse, which promotes the recruitment of microglia, under this pathologic circumstance, pruning is accelerated and there is resultant cortical atrophy and disrupted circuitry. As evidence builds, schizophrenia is looking more like a neurodevelopmental disorder rather than a neurodegenerative disorder, which was the historical thought. This is an image showing a specialized form of fluorescent microscopy showing neurons and synapses, and the C4 is in green. To summarize the take-home message of this content, enduring psychotic illness from a neurobiological and genetic perspective 
is described as a neurodevelopmental process that ultimately results in frontotemporal parietal system disconnectivity. This places the individual in a vulnerable position in the face of stressors. As you will see in the third part of this series, the encounter of stressors in the face of this underlying vulnerability ultimately leads to the symptoms of psychosis. For downloadable content such as written notes, PowerPoint slides, and more related to this lecture series, please visit my website using the link below. You can also support my goal of continuing to provide new content through Patreon, where becoming a patron will provide you with access to downloadable content as I create new content. Thank you for your support. Here are my references for this presentation. Thank you for listening.